Hello, I'm Oliver Barker, Chairman of Sotheby's Europe and Head Auctioneer. I'm excited to tell you about some of the innovations underway for Sotheby's June 29th evening sales in New York. As you likely know, many of our spring auctions were postponed, including the marquee New York sales. Now though, we'll finally be conducting our evening sales of the collections of Ginny Williams, contemporary art and impressionist and modern art. While certain aspects of the auction experience will look quite different, the most important things are the same. Like always, the sales include a diverse array of exceptional works of art from artists like Francis Bacon, Roy Lichtenstein, Joan Mitchell, Louise Bourgeois, Pablo Picasso, René Magritte and Wilfredo Lam, amongst many others. And like always, bidding will be easy. You can bid online or over the phone with a Sotheby's representative. So what's different? Well, first of all, it will be easier than ever before to learn about the works on offer, regardless of where you are. Sotheby's new digital catalogues provide in-depth scholarship, video for every work, as well as many other immersive and interactive features. Perhaps most strikingly though, while I will be the auctioneer for these three New York auctions, I will actually be here in London. A multi-camera global live stream will enable me to see and take bids from New York, Hong Kong and London in real time. In each location, my colleagues will be taking telephone bids from their clients and I will see those bids through a bank of screens in front of me. My colleagues will be able to see me through screens in their locations and they will also hear me acknowledge those bids. When you watch the auction on Sotheby's.com, you will see a dynamic global event that represents a new era for marquee auctions. We're very excited because of the innovation, because it will be easy for you to participate, whether you are bidding or just viewing, but mostly because the quality of the works on offer is exceptional, and that is always our top priority. I never ever met anyone like her, and I expect to never ever again meet someone like her because she was absolutely singular, and as we used to joke around, she was one in a row. She would call at any given moment, or she'd say, God damn it, Amy! <laughs> what, you know, what's going on? What's going on up there? What's in the building right now that I can have a look at? I need to see something beautiful. We are, it seems relatively obvious to many collectors that the works of Joan Mitchell and Lee Krasner and Helen Frankenthaler, for example, are artists that are worth collecting and worth the very high prices that they are starting to finally achieve. But what's so impressive about the Ginny Williams collection is that Ginny collected these artists in a time when no one else cared. Ginny was an important supporter of Louise Bourgeois very early on in her career, and they had a very, very close friendship. She was obviously a very passionate woman, a woman who collected from her gut instinct, from her dedication not only to the artists that she was interested in and attracted to, but certain movements which certainly made her feel a deep connection to the artworks that she became interested in. This triptych I did from the Oresteer. There's so many artists that Bacon has been looking at from the past, but he's, as always, finding his own way, finding a wording, I would say, something which is so, so singular. Each time a triptych from Francis Bacon shows up, it's, it's always an event. Only five or six uh, triptych have been up at auction in the last four years. That triptych has been part of every single Create Retrospective since it was painted. Clifford Stills 1947-Y number one 
was painted from a very formative period of the artist's career. We know this painting was important to Still because when he had one of his defining career retrospectives in 1959, he selected this work to be included. I think this painting has a lot of drama in it. You have these jagged, angular forms, these kind of crags. You have different areas of flatness of impasto, of sheen, of matte quality, and of course that crimson that just punctuates the canvas at all the right points. The majority of Still's work today rests in a few museum collections, so it's very rare for a work to come to market. Painted in 1982, Basquiat's untitled head is a jump-cut journey into the artist's mind. It's one of a series of head paintings that are unsparing in their rage and constant in their topicality. The visceral entangled head, composed with extreme velocity, was to become one of Basquiat's key motifs. The work was included in a small group of works on paper that Basquiat kept in his own collection, and which were discovered at his Crosby Street studio following his premature death in 1988. In this work, Basquiat gets to the manic core of the human condition. This is existential portraiture of an unflinching kind. In 1965, Roy Lichtenstein was in New York at the very center of the art world. He had already painted his important early depictions of comic book heroines and war paintings, and most importantly, starting his career-long investigation into art about art. But it was in 1965 when he painted this limited series of brushstroke paintings that Lichtenstein took on one of his greatest subjects of all, the hegemony of abstract expressionism. This painting encapsulates for me the very best of pop art. It is a painting that, at this critical moment in the development of an entire movement in 1965, both looks backward but points forward to an entirely new generation of art making and really sets the stage for pop artists to take a foothold in New York. So a highlight of our sale is this very beautiful portrait of Marie Therese from 1934. And it's painted in this wonderful, rich coloration, an amazing palette with a thick, vibrant, electric choice of color. And the contrast is quite fabulous between the blondes, the yellow, and the purple mauves of her skin tone. Munch was actually a passionate photographer, wildly experimental always, and used his photography as a way of building compositions and also to interrogate how we perceive the world. There's a clear depth of photography in this picture, not just in the cropping and framing of the model, I think, but also in this sense of intimacy in the way that we are entering into a private moment with the model, almost as if we were looking through a keyhole. Omi Obini belongs to a series of anthropomorphic landscapes. It was painted in 1943. What I personally find most extraordinary about this work is Lamb's use of pointillism to produce this amazing kaleidoscopic visual experience. Although titled Cage, the openness of the structure and the woman's dramatic pose with outstretched arms is suggestive of a platform, a theater, a frame that amplifies and communicates the emotions rather than hiding them. The importance of this work to Giacometti himself is epitomized by the fact that he kept it for his entire life and it was only cast in bronze after his death. Mm -hmm. 